From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center, located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Board to reconvene. And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Peters. Here. Supervisor Scribner. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, July 26th, 6 p.m. meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. Um, as we begin, I felt it would be appropriate to acknowledge the tragic death yesterday of Deputy Philip Campus. He, along with Deputy DeZander Guerrero, were wounded in the line of duty while trying to rescue victims from a home in Wasco. Uh, thankfully, Deputy Guerrero will recover from his injuries, but I am deeply saddened to note that Deputy Campus did not survive. And with that said, I would like to begin today with a flag salute led by our Kern County Fire Chief, Aaron Duncan, followed by a moment of prayer, silence, or meditation in honor of Deputy Campus, his family, and all of our law enforcement officers and first responders. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to this flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For tonight's meeting, we have an interpreter providing translation of these proceedings for anyone in the board chamber desiring to hear the proceedings in Spanish. If required, Mr. Lopez will also come down to the podium to provide Spanish to English translation for Spanish-speaking uh, audience members to address the board. With that, I would like to invite Mr. Fernando Lopez down to the podium to share this information with our Spanish-speaking audience. Para la Junta esta noche, el, la Junta de Supervisores han proporcionado a un intérprete para cualquier persona que quiera escuchar lo que pa está pasando en el despacho de la Junta de Supervisores. Si al fin de la, de la reunión pueden hablar, pero atrás en la mesa hay unos audífonos para los que no hablan español o inglés. We'll begin by considering item number one, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the board. Board members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make referrals to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the board at a later meeting. Also, the board may take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state and spell your name before making your presentation. Is there anyone in attendance that would like to address the board? Please come to the podium. Good evening. My name is Karen Bussard, B-U-S-S-A-R-D. I am a chapter officer for SEIU Local 521. On behalf of SEIU 521 members and Kern County Chapter President Veronica Vasquez, we send our heartfelt condolences to the family, friends, and coworkers of those impacted by yesterday's incident in Wasco, California, especially our colleagues at KLEA. We send our gratitude and appreciation to the health care workers of Kern Medical for their ongoing support of recovery efforts for all the victims, our dispatchers that are consummate consummate um, professionals during these difficult times and our many SEIU local 521 members that provide support to KCSO. We must continue to support the family and the loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers wishing to speak under public presentations?
I uh, know that Karen's voice didn't carry that well. I hope you can hear my voice. Yes. We can. Uh, my name is uh, Gil Garcia, and I uh, uh, live in uh, District 3, and I work in uh, District 5. And I just wanted to add to um, what happened Sunday night in regards to the, the five people that uh, lost their lives. So one including our uh, deputy compass that we just had our silent prayer on. Um, I realize that we, uh, as community members, as well as the leadership here, we have a responsibility to the community. Sunday's incident is a reflection of that responsibility. I worked in four departments here for Kern County, including public health, mental health, and probation. I realize that domestic violence, in terms of cases that come through every year, more than 5,000 cases associated with domestic violence against women and children and others. So in this incident, the reason it's important to me and near and dear to my heart is that I, as a community member and, and working in, in, in the field of social work and so forth, I realized that what happened in this incident that maybe could have been prevented? Meaning, at what point when a restraining order was issued against this particular individual, what services did the county provide or reach out to the individual? What could we have done? And I know that this involves CPS, DHS, probation, the sheriff's department, the courts, the coroner's office now. It, it becomes a, a, a convoluted, uh, unfortunately, tragedy. And the reason I bring it up is the decisions that you make as leaders in this county affect why we're here, how we do our jobs, and what do we need to do our jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other speakers under public presentations? Good evening, Chairman, and good evening, members of the board. My name is Tanya Salinas, T-A-N-I-A-S-A-L-I-N-A-S. -A 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 I am a Kern County employee, and I am a District 4 uh, voter. Tonight, once again, we will sit in this chamber and hear about revenues available to the county to disperse to the community in different avenues. Once again, we will hear about the funds available within the general fund that continue to be held in reserve at the discretion of the board, 21 million surplus as of today. County employees will hear the once again unspoken but clearly heard and understood message of wait your turn, not this year. Once again, SAU. Ma'am, ma I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if this is about budget, um, that, that that's an agenda item that's coming up. This is for, for issues that aren't on the uh, agenda. And I can I can go ahead and, and speak on item three. That's fine. Okay. I just wanted to get out of the way, but uh, that's perfectly fine. I'll wait my turn. No, How's no that? problem. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, uh, are there any other speakers uh, that would like to speak on item uh, not on the, the agenda? Good evening, everybody. My name is Nadine Escalante. After hearing what happened in Wasco, I was very devastated. I was devastated for the people that I know that work in the Sheriff's Department. I reached out to my friend that worked there and gave my condolences to his employees in that department. But I also got chills being a survivor of domestic violence and seeing how many cases we have here in Kern County of women being killed. As Mr. Gill said earlier, this is a county issue. CPS, Department of Human Services, probation, the courts, our law enforcement, everybody's hands are responsible for these families, these children. And the reason why I speak about these children is I was one of these children. I was removed from my family's home for domestic violence. And 40 years later, we have not improved our situation in this county. We have to do something. Two young men were killed yesterday. As we remember the sheriff's lives, the sheriff who, who lost his life and the one who's fighting for his, let's also remember the mother and her two sons and the other family members that were in that home. There is grandparents, aunts and uncles and friends grieving 
for this woman, and I guarantee you those two boys were protecting their mother. Let us not forget those victims. Thank you. Our next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Riddhi S. Patel, R-I-D-D-H-I Patel, P-A-T-E-L. And this weekend, the one thing I've always loved about Kern County, because I was born and raised here, is that every single one of us is usually one to three degrees of separation away. I still live in Mr. Couch's supervisorial district. His son was in my brother's Boy Scout troop. He has quite literally been in my home and we've seen each other. And I'm sure many of us in this room have known each other for a long time since we were children. And for those of you who do know me and the way I talk, I would like to say one, my bark is a lot worse than my bite. And I don't really, sometimes when we see things like what happened yesterday, I think of like the collective care that we could be providing each other and the man who spoke before me about every point in the system that failed us to get to where we were yesterday. Every single one of those people who lost their lives yesterday, the five individuals, we failed them as a community and as a community that are supposed to care about each other. And I know that as we go on on this budget and we look at the SE. IU rank and file workers behind us that are going to talk about the need that they need for public services to help our community because we are supposed to have community care and actually understand the issues that we face growing up and what we face in this county with all of our other injustices is that we have a responsibility to understand that what happened yesterday could have been prevented by us and we failed them, every single one of them yesterday, and that's on us. And I really hope we understand community care better as we go forth and hear these public comments of SEIU workers and what they need from the county to actually provide services to this community. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Uh, Randy Andrade, I'm here with the union, but also wanted to make a statement to you guys. Um, about two years ago, you guys passed a rule where we couldn't get promotions because of budgets. I was one of those people who was recommended for promotion, but was denied because of the rule you guys passed. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I did get an increment, but I didn't get a promotion. Uh, I reached out to you guys. I sent an email to, if you guys are all the same ones, um, sent out an email to you guys asking to meet with you uh, to discuss why I wasn't getting my promotion due to your guys' Sorry, you can't hear me? I, I, I didn't get that, but... Um, I'll forward it to you. you. You were on it. You're my representative, actually. Um, and uh, instead of talking to me, one of you reached out to HR. HR then called my home and then told me it was unfortunate that I didn't like my job. Um, so I don't appreciate that you guys did that to me. Uh, why you did it, I don't know, but that's what happened. And uh, it's been a show ever since, and I've been dealing with it, and now I'm here asking for a raise. But um, just want to let you know that as my representative, you guys failed me, and it was completely disrespectful what you asked for, because they said that you, one of you, the Board of Supervisors directed them to call my home. Thank you. Can I ask him a question? Sure, like, sure sir, when did that call occur? July 31st, 5.01 p.m. Uh, it was into your residence, your cell phone? It's on my cell phone, after hours. Uh, by okay. HR. Thank you so much. We have our next speaker, please. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll now consider item number two, board member announcements or reports. Are there any board members that would like to speak? Okay, uh, we'll now move to item number three under the county administrative office, and that is a public meeting to receive comments for fiscal year 2021 through 2022. And for that, I will turn it over to our CAO, Ryan Alsop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'll just uh, have Ms. Martinez, our chief financial officer, come to the mic and make a presentation. Good 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, I have been in front of you many years, and, and I have to tell you, I have, this is the first time that I present to you after a tragedy, and, and it's with my deepest sympathy to the family and, and to the family of the deputy involved. We must continue the business of the people. So I'm gonna give you a presentation and I hope um, people understand that um, this is something we have to do. It, it has no reflection on what, had, what happened. As I was preparing my remarks tonight, I realized that today is my 12th budget. I began my career with the county administrative office in the middle of the housing uh, market crash and the national recession that followed. We have seen, we have faced many challenges, but also I have seen the leadership and hard work of our department's management and employees. As we, find, as we finalize our fiscal year 21-22 budget, I am cautiously optimistic, but certain that whatever comes our way, we will continue to do our best to save, to serve our community. I want to begin tonight's presentation reminding your board and the public about the budget process. I think there's a little bit of confusion. We begin the budget process in mid-January, evaluated the mid-year results and the impacts of the estimated assessed valuation provided by the assessor's office. We then prepare what is called the budget guideline. This is an incremental budget approach. It is the most common approach used by governments across the nation. This approach typically maintains the status quo if possible and allows your board to see what increases or savings are needed to balance the budget. As a reminder, the guideline was established in March based on the assessor's estimate of 3.06% decrease in total assessed valuation as a result as a modest increase in our residential and commercial properties and a decrease of 30 to 40% in oil and gas properties resulting from $50 price of barrel and the changes in permitting regulations. With the projected increases in sales and use taxes, realignment, Proposition 172, the guideline did not include reductions to departments. After your board approved the guideline in March, departments prepared and submitted their budgets to our office. After working with departments for several weeks in June, we presented the preliminary budget. The preliminary budget is available for public review at the county website. Tonight, I'm here to provide your board with an update to the preliminary budget. It is also an opportunity for the public to provide additional comments. As I indicated in June, our preliminary budget is three billion in appropriations. This is approximately 47.5 million less than fiscal year 2021 adopted budget. This is, there decreases the result of reductions in care funding. And um, we are offsetting this decrease with increases in state and federal funding for social services, health and community development. The preliminary budget is funded with a variety of sources, including one billion in government in assistance from the state and federal government listed on, under intergovernmental revenue. The general fund that funds most of the county operations total 851.9 million. The preliminary general fund budget provided 380 million in what we call net general fund allocations to departments. This is 4.30% less than, this, than the last fiscal year. This reduction to departments is offset by additional state and federal funding. Therefore, departments were not anticipated to see an overall reduction in spending. The preliminary budget for the general fund also allocated 363 million in discretionary revenue. We were projecting a decrease of 6.6 .6 million from the prior year adopted budget. The discretionary revenue included funding uh, in, for sales taxes, hotel taxes, as well as interest earning. All of those were increasing. However, it also included a reduction in property tax revenue of 5.2 million for the general fund, primarily as a result of the assessor's initial projected decrease in oil and gas. In order to preserve resources, I 
told your board in June that 16.8 million in net fund balance and 6.5 million in research were included to maintain operational costs. So tonight, we will be providing your board with the closing fund balance, also known as carry forward and the final property tax revenue estimates based on the assessor final role. After tomorrow's presentation, we will rebalance the budget and make adjustments to the preliminary budget based on critical needs and your board's priorities and direction. A main goal is to align one-time resources such as fund balance to one-time costs and ongoing resources such as property taxes to operational costs. Um, I think your board heard a comment last week that the assessor final role is one, um, $103.5 billion and results in an overall increase in property tax related revenue for the general fund of $11.9 million from the preliminary budget. While this is good news, the assessment roll growth is less than the previous year as oil and revenues continue to be affected by market uncertainties and increased regulation from the state. In addition, based on information provided by our sales tax consultant, we have also increased our sales tax estimate an additional 2.7 million. Increases in interest earnings and other revenue combined with an increase of property related revenue result in a total discretionary revenue increase of 16.4 million in discretionary, discretionary revenue from the preliminary budget. In addition to this increase on ongoing discretionary revenue, the county ended fiscal year 2021 with a net fund balance of 69.2 million. This amount takes into consideration rebudgets of projects that were incomplete a year end, reestablishment of budget savings incentives, and the net amount is available for allocations in the 21-22 budget. This carry forwards includes the additional one-time discretionary revenue collected last fiscal year that I have been reporting to your board monthly under our 2021 budget contingency plan. With the additional ongoing discretionary revenue of 16.4 million, we are proposing the following ongoing adjustments for this source. We are recommending an allocation to the assessor, animal service, and public defender to ensure that critical staff is available to provide services. Additional allocations to the auditor controller and information technology services for the implementation of our human resources and payroll and finance system to replace our 40-year-old legacy system is recommended. Additional allocations to pay for the county share of maintenance costs at certain cost, um, core facilities is also included. We were informed in, in early July that our estimate for next year is $245,000 higher than initially budgeted. Finally, we are covering an ongoing budget gap of $15 million identified in the preliminary budget. As you can see in this table, the overall ongoing cost totals 19.6 million, while our discretionary revenue is only 16.4. This means that we will be using 3.2 million in one-time fund balance to cover the ongoing cost. We are confident that property tax growth in the following year will cover this um, budget gap. As I mentioned, the, ca the county ended fiscal year 2021 with a net fund balance of 69.2 million. After the use of 3.2 million to mitigate the ongoing cost, we have proposed the following one-time cost for, th for this resource. We will be allocating 15 million to major maintenance and capital projects, and I'll go further in the presentation with a little bit more detail on those. We are allocating 3.8 million for replacement of shared patrol vehicles. And just as, like in previous fiscal years, we'll be allocating the appro to appropriations for contingencies 1.5 million for the probation department staff costs if needed. 
We have also allocated approximately a little bit over half a million, 589.32, to, as a property tax rebate negotiated under the advanced current initiative. <laughs> This year, our election division will be conducting two elections, the recall election and the primary election. Um, it is anticipated that 1.2 million is needed to cover the statewide primary election since we don't anticipate additional revenue coming either from other local elections or the state. The state will, we anticipate that the state will pay for the recall but not for the primary, which they never have. We are providing additional allocations to the auditor's office to backfill audit staff that is currently working on the implementation of the new financial system. And as I noted in the staff report, the sheriff continues to cope with logistic issues at the corner facility. Transportation costs continue to increase and an allocation of $200,000 has been identified and provided to the sheriff's budget to cover this cost. Your board also approved the lease of a new facility that will be used as the corner facility after certain improvements are completed. 79,000 has been allocated to general services to this, for design costs related to the improvements. We are also proposing 7.7 .7 million to cover the first three year lease um, payments for the corner facility. And although it is a 15 year lease, this project is, um, for this project, our goal is to exercise the lease por uh, purchase option at the first opportunity, which will minimize the overall project cost. 20.2 million is being recommended to um, set aside for the public safety and emergency response communication system. This also mitigate the need to finance the entire project and minimize the overall project costs. Um, the, as I mentioned um, during my June presentation, 65.1 million in the retirement designation will be used to offset the cost of our retirement for public safety departments. We are recommending an allocation of 14.1 million to this designation for a net increase of 7.6 million. As in previous years, this designation is used to offset retirement costs to mitigate se service level impacts. Finally, um, the last line item on that table is 1.2 million of one-time costs which were included in the preliminary budget and were expected to be covered with fund balance. Now let's talk about capital projects and major maintenance. As I mentioned, 15 million is proposed for capital projects and major maintenance. Of that amount, 60.4 million has been allocated for park improvements and include the Casa Loma Lighting Project, 1.5 million for park improvements throughout the county supervisorial districts, improvements at Hard Park and Kern River campgrounds. We also have 649,000 for legally mandated projects required by the American with Disability Act and state mandated recycling requirements. We have added $250,000 for energy efficiencies and water conservation projects throughout the county. The category labeled utility and major system repair and replacement include elevator, heater ventilation and air conditioning repairs, as well as fire system replacement and additional funds to replace the water tank at Lerdo. Finally, the preventive maintenance and reconstruction includes repairs of roofs for county facilities, including the much needed roof replacement at Camp Owens. Reserves and designations. Um, as I mentioned, we're proposing adding one-time funds to retirement, the corner facility, and the public safety communi communication project. With the additional increase, the total reserves and, and designations will have a balance of $246.8 million during fiscal year 21-22. It is important to remember that most of the designations were established for specific purposes, including replacement of critical infrastructure and systems, such as the public safety communication, the corner facility, and our payroll system. Uh, just to keep this in perspective, monthly, monthly cash flows in the general fund is approximately 7.8 million. 
the Government Finance Officers Association recommends at a minimum two months of regular general fund operating expenditures uh, in, in designations. Including the designations for the much needed capital projects are available balancing reserves and designations is approximately that minimum of two months. Our fiscal stability reserve is only 23, day, 23 days of cash coverage. There are always questions about our fire fund. Our fire fund is also benefiting from the increase in property tax. The preliminary budget for the fire fund included expenditures of $152.2 million. The fire fund is primarily funded with property tax, including the property tax transfer from the general fund your board approved last fiscal year. The preliminary budget included funding for all firefighter positions. However, it required the use of $3.1 million in one-time resources for operational needs. It also did not include funding for station or equipment replacement. The additional property tax and the increase in funding related to the dissolution of redevelopment agencies, the fire fund will have sufficient ongoing resources to, co to cover its operational needs during fiscal year 21-22. Just as the general fund, the fire fund ended with a carry forward or fund balance of 8.8 .8 million at June 30th. For fiscal year 21-22, we are recommending that the 8.8 .8 million be used to fund a portion of the 50 million in capital repra replacement needs. Last year, your board approved and funded from the general fund 10 million in capital purchases. The fire fund also has 1 million in a designation for the shafted operational area. The resource in this designation is generated by the city of chapter property tax and the use in the designation must be coordinated with the city of chapter. Finally, the general designation and fiscal stability will provide fiscal stability to the fire fund until such time as agreements with cities for, um, for discretionary services are finalized. Before I conclude my Prepare remarks, I would like to remind your board and the public that while the state approved its budget, significant negotiations continue past July 1st. We are still reviewing the budget trailer bills to ensure that we capture all the impacts in the final recommended budget. Also, your board approved the initial plan for the use of the American Rescue Plan funds. The common period for the interim rule concluded July 9. We are awaiting final guidance and will make changes to the initial plan if necessary. I know it's a lot of information, but I am available to answer any question your board at, may have at this time or at the conclusion of public comments. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak regarding this item? If so, would you please come down to the podium? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jacob Evans, J-A-C-O-B-E-V-A-N-S. I've been a deputy public defender for this county since 2008. Our department is in a crisis. We are flailing. We regularly violate our duties under the Constitution. We need funding, and a lot of it, and we need it urgently. If the state chooses to prosecute, it is ob obligated to provide for the defense too. By national standards, we need nearly triple our current workforce. Those standards are old, and by modern measures, we need even more. We need an immigration specialist, social workers, paralegals, mitigation specialists, appellate attorneys, arraignment teams, transcriptionists, and supervisors. We should be, but we aren't, properly addressing arraignment Arraignments, bail, mental health, investigations, immigration consequences, training, recruitment, and retention. Retention is especially a problem. We just don't offer competitive pay anymore. Worse still, when we lose staff, we just defund the positions. 
Those who are supervisors are so in name only, and they carry full caseloads of their own, leaving no room for supervision, guidance, training, observation, or teamwork. Our management observes, absorbs more and more responsibilities previously handled by lower supervisors or regular staff, and they can't handle it all. They don't have the resources to properly do their own jobs anymore. This isn't new. In 2019, the grand jury told us to address workloads, burnout, turnover, recruitment, and retention. The board asked us for solutions, and we provided none, and nothing has come of it. Our office has been trimmed so thin in resources and institutional courage that we now find excuses for inaction. As a supervisor said to me in an email, if we do our job here, we'll have to do it everywhere, so instead we'll do it nowhere. Our current funding is exposing us to the risk of very costly litigation, like what happened up in Fresno under remarkably similar circumstances. We need the funding to do it. We need a lot of it. We need competitive pay to maintain proper staffing levels, and we need it urgently. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next speaker, please. Excuse me. Please, please refrain from clapping, cheering, booing, any of that. We just want to hear and listen to everybody and be respectful of their remarks. So if we could have our next speaker, please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Crystal Ratliff. I began as a deputy public defender in Kern County in September of 2012. I'm here to advocate for cost of living increases for our workers. In its 2019 and 2020 report on the Kern County Public Defender's Office, the Kern County Grand Jury issued a report finding, among other things, that our office would benefit if attorney, attorney retention were improved. They recommended that the office should make proposals in order to increase retention of attorneys. This board, in its response, acknowledged that ours is a stressful and demanding field, that our work is often grueling and creates burnout, but that our experience here makes our attorneys highly marketable elsewhere. I agree with the board's response. However, this board also responded that Kern County has a lower cost of living and that its salaries are comparable to other counties within the state. That I disagree with. Kern County's starting salary right now for a deputy public defender one is $4,819 per month. Right now, there are four counties in California hiring for deputy public defender one positions and all have a higher starting salary than Kern. Those counties include El Dorado, Merced, Solano, and our neighbors to the north, Tulare. Results are similar for job postings for deputy public defenders two, three, four, and five positions. We aren't talking about densely populated liberal coastal counties here. We are sadly no longer competitive with counties like Merced, Stanislaw, Tulare, and Tolomne. While wages remain stagnant, the cost of living continues to increase. Three years ago, my family purchased our first home here in Bakersfield. We paid $250,000 and a comparable home in our neighborhood that is smaller and on a smaller lot is now listed at $420,000. The last time this board approved a cost of living increase, the median home, in, uh, home price in Bakersfield was $181,000. As of June 2021, the median home price in Bakersfield is $319,000. Home ownership is becoming unattainable for attorneys and is nearly impossible for our lower paid ancillary staff. Uh, could you please bring your comments to a close or 30 seconds over the time? Yes. If this board truly cares about retention in the public defender's office, we need a cost of living increase for all of our workers across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, Chairman Peters and members of the board. My name is Robin Walters. I am president of the Democratic Women of Kern. We at DWK are particularly concerned about one of our most fundamental rights, the right to vote and the right to have our vote counted. Our elections department is critical to our county, yet it remains extremely underfunded. Legally, they must open daily with no guarantee of funding or staff. 
They need funding for machines, employees and training. You can't rely solely on volunteers to staff polling places because they don't always show up. Besides our election clerk, Mary Bedard, the most senior member has been at the department only six years. That's three elections. You need to attract and retain valuable experienced workers. At a time when elections are under intense scrutiny, you must make certain our votes can be cast and counted. Now, I too want to speak to you as a deputy public defender from the juvenile unit and member of SEIU. We are responsible for advocating for the protection, safety, and physical and emotional well-being of children. When you fail to adequately fund our attorneys and staff, you inflict trauma on children. And that trauma is inflicted over and over again. The Judicial Council says optimal caseloads are 77 children per attorney, with 188 as the maximum. Arkansas's maximum is 75. Georgia is 100. Washington State is 80. And New York is 150. I currently have over 350 children, and I am not alone. It is impossible to fulfill my obligations to each of those children. Concerns are not investigated. Kids are left in dangerous situations, like the children with the deputy who was killed over this weekend. Children suffer the uncertainty of foster care, the loss of their siblings, the inability to go home with parents who actually have gotten it together, or being sent home only to be removed again. I could go on and on and on about the trauma that is inflicted on our children. And that's what happens when you don't fund this work. As someone who is passionate about serving these children, I implore you to adequately fund those of us who serve these children every day, because when you don't, their blood's on you. Okay, can we get our next speaker, please? And please try and be mindful of the two-minute time limit. Good evening, Chairman Philip Peters and board members. My name is Imelda Seha Butkowitz. I'm president of the current Inyo Emona County Central Labor Council. The 30 unions that make up the CLC include more than 30,000 working people. Our members come from every walk of life and are what makes America great and has always. The CLC strives to ensure all working people are treated fairly with decent paychecks and benefits, safe jobs, dignity, and equal opportunities. Today, I come before you in support of my brothers and sisters, SEIU 521 and UDW. Public workers in Kern County have always been essential to our community's most vulnerable residents. And now, as we work towards a recovery from a pandemic, prioritizing investment in critical services is necessary to keep Kern County residents protected and healthy and thriving. County workers have not been given a raise since 2013. There is no excuse. According to the assessor's office, the value of taxable property in the county has increased by nearly one billion. That equals to about 11.9 million increase in property tax revenue to the county, which has been estimated at around 280 million for the fiscal year 21-22. It's time for this board to pay a fair wage for our essential workers who sacrificed to improve the lives of working families and support the county's economy. I ask this Board of Supervisors to come together, prioritize our communities, invest in critical services, and finally, finally compensate essential workers who sacrificed to improve the lives of working families and support the county's economy. Together, together, we can and we will. Thank you. Thank you. Could we get our next speaker, please? Hello, once again. Thanks. My name is Tanya Salinas. I am a Kern County employee and I'm an SIU member. Tonight, once again, we heard in this chamber, we sat in this chamber and heard about revenues available to the county to disperse to the community in different avenues. Once again, we heard about the funds available within the general fund that continue to be held in reserve at the discretion of the board, 21 million surplus as of today. County employees will hear 
the once again unspoken but clearly unheard and understood message of wait your turn, not this year. Once again, SEIU 521 essential workers will be asked to continue to make sacrifices and wait their turn. This is a continuous phrase that we have heard for the last 13 years. Time after time, county employees have pushed through to do our jobs through pay and mitigations, promotion of freezes, increased health care costs, and the pandemic. In action to address stagnant wages and rampant turnover rates continue to hurt us in our community's access to critical services and care. Essential workers continue to hear the praise without the race. To quote our SEIU 521 CEO Rico Mendez, basta, enough. Stop the praise, give us a race. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board. I am Deborah McClanahan, M-C-C-L-A-N-A-H-A-N. I am a 15-year Kern County employee, a voting constituent of Mr. Scrivener's district, as well as a loyal and dedicated SEIU Local 521 member. I work at the Department of Human Services, Mojave, district office as an office services assistant who supports the eligibility workers who support families reaching out for food, rent, assistance uh, or essential clothing, housing, medical coverage, and, and basic needs, general needs, you know, toiletries, sanitation. There are not enough workers to assist the growing population in Kern County needing assistance. When Kern County boasts of a 42% turnover rate and a 24% staff vacancy rate, the problem of recruiting and retraining workers is because of stagnant wages. Property taxes are at an all-time high and tax rolls have been at an all-time high for the past five years years, and yet county leaders still do not invest in the community and workforce, leaving families without food, clothing, shelter, and health care. It is time for the Board of Supervisors to provide a fair, across-the-board cost-of-living increase for 13 years that is past due. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, Chairman Peters. My name is Francisco Martinez. We're going to present something to the clerk, a document. And I'm just going to read it off. These are green cards from all our union brothers and sisters. Um, didn't take very too long. We're all pretty busy, but uh, we had more. But we're gonna. I'm just gonna read off what uh, the the cards state. Crown County workers have always been essential. The public health crisis demonstrated just how crucial we are. We are. We all are to the overall health and safety of our community. And now to miss the recovery. Investing in the safeguards that pulled Kern County through the pandemic is more critical than ever. Too many children and elders across our community lack decent care, the rise in mental health, the rise in mental health needs is growing every day, and families are being forced to decide between feeding their families or seeking care. As county workers, it is our duty to advocate for those we serve. They are our friends, family, and neighbors. We've chosen to live and raise our families in Kern County because we believe in, it, in its ability to, to thrive for all. But it can only thrive if we also advocate for, uh, for ourselves. We, together with our county colleagues, urge you to take bold action by funding the front line and investing in public services to address the, the decades-long stagnant wages. Staffing, short, staffing shortages and rampant turnover that has crippled our ability to care for our community. Thank you, and uh, we'll go ahead and roll it over and give it to the clerk. 
Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? I'll give it to you afterwards. My name is Emma de la Rosa, Policy Advocate with Leadership Council. This budget cycle, the County Board of Supervisors is in a unique position to invest resources and financially support its, con its constituents who are often overlooked. Federal funding directed for communities most impacted by COVID-19 is in the hands of the board to allocate for communities who kept the county running while most of us sheltered at home. Um, thus, based on our work alongside communities and most, impact, most impacted by COVID-19, uh, we uh, recommend the following um, investments in our community. In order to ensure that the county is, is properly responding to the public health crisis, we ask that you prioritize and fund community-based organizations in order for, for all of us to lead a grassroots approach. We also ask that the water and sewer infrastructure include Fuller Acres community. Uh, this community, as I mentioned before, is almost exceeding ar arsenic and has high uh, TCP levels. We ask that water filtration systems and reverse osmosis systems are included in this budget, si budget cycle, along with um, Arvin and Lamont. We also ask that the county explore and invest in green infrastructure um, in Hilltop Fuller Acres to alleviate flooding, runoff impacts, and also in, uh, decrease the risk of water contamination and reduce the air pollution. Um, in addition to that, I ask that the, a lot, that the allocation for essential pay is increased in order to include all essential workers in addition to the county workers. We ask that uh, funding is included for infrastructure improvements for Hilltop Fuller Acres as well as Casa Loma. Um, for, uh, for example, Hilltop Fuller Acres does not have one single street light. I'm sure your homes have street lights and these communities deserve lights as well. We also ask that in order for you to, to properly respond to the housing situation, that you all invest in infill infrastructure and rehabilitate uh, vacant and unused homes. Those homes are just sitting there costing y'all um, code enfor enforcement funding. So please use those space wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Hi, everybody. My name is Luis Gomez, and I'm from Fuller Acres. I'm a direct director from Fuller Acres Water Company. And uh, I've been there for 30 years, and uh, I haven't seen nothing be done in my community. I come to talk for my community, and uh, only I see is Increasing my taxes only, but nothing done, not even the lights. It's so dark, somebody could get here with the car. As you remember me, one time we walked to the streets, and you see how dark it is there. there. So I ask all the supervisors to do something for my community. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening. My name is Hope Miller, and I am a proud member of the SEIU and a proud staff member of Kern Medical. And so I come to you this evening um, with much of the same approach as the people who have spoken this evening who have the same concerns as county employees. So it's not a new approach. But my concern is that for Kern Medical and for this community after this pandemic, um, as many of you are aware, um, Kern Medical has been a pillar for community the resources since 1867, not something that you're not aware of. But in this pandemic, we saw great numbers of loss of life, um, loss of staff, 
great um, demands on our resources and those providers and who met just as much as all of these who um, sat behind me, who faced the tragedies, um, the outpouring that needed the, the community so needed. And I'm sure a lot of you faced the tragedies as well. But back to this is that <clears throat> what many of you don't know is that our staff facilitates renowned and highly respected providers in the care and research of Valley Fever. We offer much needed and in demand inpatient psychiatric care and proudly um, we do this on a daily basis. During the pandemic, we were faced with a, in, um, an impossible situation for the number of psychiatric care needs because they couldn't reach resources. They didn't have the ability to get to their providers. Those social workers, those healthcare workers that weren't available to them. So our overstaffed nurses, residents, and providers, um, it's current medical without your funding is only as good as the next Delta variant, the next tragedy. And we have to be proactive in that next approach. And it's an unfortunate thing, but the pandemics are our new vocabulary. And even though we can vaccinate and we can be proactive in that approach, it's the events of what happened this weekend that if we don't make the pillar of um, traumatic care, we are the largest trauma facility between Fresno and Los Angeles. Ma'am, um, we're over 45 seconds I'm over sorry. right now. So well, I just want to make sure please. that we have consideration for you for the budget so we can take care of our law enforcement, our fire personnel in the event of those traumas and the I-5 and 99 corridor for your family and loved ones as they travel. Thank, Thank you. you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Hi, good evening. My name is Jennifer Martinez. I'm a, I was born and raised in the Hilltop Fuller Acres community. Um, I'm a property owner there as well. First off, I just want to apologize to our county employees that they have to come to public meetings to demand equitable wages. But I'm here to talk about Fuller Acres. You've heard that uh, community mentioned a couple times. Um, Supervisor Scribner, um, you went out there to the community a few years ago. Um, the residents met with you. They told you they needed sidewalks. They needed clean water, clean air. A bus stop that's safe for students um, and street lights you know the list goes on and on and you told them that they you couldn't help them that they needed to look for grants um, or some type of other funding because the county didn't have funding well now with the American Rescue Plan there's an opportunity to support these communities and so we're definitely calling on you to Please provide the resources and support that these community needs. Um, and it's not just Hilltop Fuller Acres, right? We're also talking about Lamont. Uh, we're talking about all the rural communities where a lot of farm workers are living. A lot of the folks that put food on our tables throughout the pandemic and were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, their quality of life matters. And it's really important that y'all make the decisions to please funnel those resources into those communities for basic goods, basic goods that they should already have have access to. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Uh, she might need a translator. <laughs> okay. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es María Martínez. Good afternoon. My name is María Martínez. Yo también soy una persona que vivo en la área de Fuller Acre Waters por más de 30 años. ¿En dónde? En la Fuller Acre Waters. I also live in the 40 Fuller, Fuller Acre Acres Waters. waters. Uh -huh. eh, por estos 30 años nosotros hemos sufrido porque nosotros okay. no tenemos drenaje. For these past 30 years, we have suffered. We have no drainage. No tenemos luces. We have no lights. Yo fui víctima de robo porque pues está muy oscuro ahí. I was a victim of a robbery because it's very dark there. 
no tenemos áreas verdes donde podamos, pues nosotros como personas ya mayores, poder caminar o, o los yeah. niños poder jugar. We have no, no green spaces there where we can get together for elderly people can walk or young people can play. Entonces, yo les estoy pidiendo de favor que pues nos incorporen porque somos personas trabajadoras del campo. Okay. I ask you the favor we can be incorporated because we are people that work in the fields. Somos las personas que ah, fuimos infectadas de COVID por estar okay. trabajando. We are the people who are infected by COVID because we were out working. So, pagamos también taxes igual que todas las personas. We pay taxes like everyone else. Pues necesitamos que volteen a vernos y hagan algo por nosotros, por lo menos banquetas okay. o luces. We need you to turn around and look at us because we have needs, at least street lights or sidewalks. Pues es lo que todo les pido a ustedes que están ahí, que nos, the, nos puedan ayudar. Muchas all, gracias. All I ask for is if you can help us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have our next speaker, please? My name is Teresa Macias. I am a resident of Casa Loma. Gracias por incluir al parque de la Casa Loma en la infraestructura. Gracias por eso. Thank you for including the Casa Loma Park in the infrastructure. Thank you. Y, y aprovechando para eh, por estar aquí para uh, decir que eh, por el área exactamente de y, y, y por la Casa Loma y la Madison. By Madison and Casa Loma. No hay luz en la noche y los residentes no pueden salir. A, There are no street lights at night. The residents cannot come out. Ya, yeah, este. Y, y también um, los niños... Okay, no, also the children uh, no tienen un lugar donde puedan salir en las tardes a caminar. Do not have somewhere to go out in the afternoons uh, uh, and take a walk. Me, me refiero a parte como de, del parque cuando hace mucho aire y llueve. I'm referring aside from the park when it's raining or it's very windy. Y que no se puede estar afuera. And you cannot be outside. Este, no hay un lugar donde puedan llegar a, a estar, a estar este, platicando, There's jugando. nowhere where they can congregate. Y, y cosas por el estilo. En la calle. Y por la calle La Nina también, ahí cerquita de la, la qué? Casa, La Nina, la calle La Nina. And there's a street there called La Nina. Y también este, no hay banquetas. There's also no sidewalks there. Cuando llueve. When it rains. Se llena de agua la, la calle. The street turned into a big puddle. Y también este, ha, ha habido un par de accidentes sobre, las, sobre la calle La Madison, en las enfrente de la Casa Loma. La there Chico. have also been accidents on Madison Street near Casa Loma. Ya, yeah, ajá, y todo, todo eso. Entonces, este, All that entire area. Eso es básicamente. Gracias. That's basically it. Thank you. Gracias por incluirnos en el presupuesto. Thank you for including us in the, in the budget. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Isaac Sanchez, I work at ETR. I'm a departmental analyst, uh, but specifically I do uh, labor market and statistical information, so provide informational support to state and local officials regarding the local labor market. Um, primarily I'm here to support my colleagues, my coworkers, my union brothers and sisters in their fight for higher wages, the cost of living adjustment and premium pay. Um, I, I want to say that I often sit down with uh, local firms, employers, Uh, who are adjusting their wage schedules. They want to know what to pay their people to attract better workers. It's often a very discouraging uh, experience um, because they just straight up do not want to pay the wages that are going to attract the workers that they want and the employees that, are, that do the work for them that they don't really want to keep. Um, wages are how you show your people that you value them um, and they're how you keep the people that you value. So um, I specifically work on a, a project called the B3K Initiative. Um, that's what I do over at ETR. It's one of the, the grants I, I, uh, I work on. Uh, it was specifically very discouraging to see that the uh, wage for a good job in Kern County was listed as one that is higher than the one that I earn and higher than hundreds of other county workers that I work with. Um, that was a very discouraging experience. Um, it's something that the county should not be proud of, it's something that should be a dark spot on the, on the county's uh, reputation. Um, 
I'm very thankful for my job at the county. I work with great people, um, but it's very discouraging as a, I'll, I'll be in my second year working for the county to see employees who have been there for five times, five, five times as many years as I have, 10 times as many years as I have, who haven't seen a wage increase since 2007. I think I was, I don't know, in elementary school or middle school in, in 2007. Um, that's totally inappropriate. Um, it's unacceptable. Um, so I'm, I'm here to support my uh, union brothers and sisters in that fight, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Buenas tardes. Good afternoon a todos. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Gemma Perez. I'm from Greenfield Walking Group. And I'm Rosalba Ruiz, and I am from Greenfield Walking Group. Una a la vez. Sí, sí, solamente voy a hablar yo nada más. Para mí aquí, sí. Voy a hablar yo aquí. Diga su nombre. Sí, a mi nombre es Gemma Perez. My name is Gemma Perez. The Greenfield Walking Group. From the Greenfield Walking Group. No había tenido la oportunidad para darle las gracias personalmente al supervisor Scribner. I would like to take this moment to uh, give thanks to Supervisor Scribner. Por las banquetas en el parque de Greenfield. For the, the sidewalks on the Greenfield Park. Y también este quisiera abogar por esa área de casas. I would also like to be an advocate for the housing in that area. Si son casas que no tienen banquetas, ni the, tienen drenaje. Those homes that have a drainage, they do not have, a, I think he means gutters, he, they do not have lights or sidewalks. Y también queremos apoyar a la comunidad de Taft. We also would like to support the Taft community. Uh, un maestro de la universidad. A professor from the university. Me llamó pidiendo nuestro apoyo called me asking for our support. Está a un grupo de jóvenes que juegan en el parque. He's trying to help a group of youth to play in the park. Fort City. Fort City. Es también del Distrito 2. It's also a district number two. Ellos quieren hacer uh, mejoras a ese parque. They would like to improve that park. Quieren ver cómo podemos trabajar con usted. They would like to see if we can work with you. Y ver si podemos hacer una reunión, quizá por Zoom o algo para que we can set up a Zoom meeting or something. Para que ellos puedan decir cuáles son sus preocupaciones. So they can state their issues. Y también están dispuestos a, a ver cómo ellos pueden ayudar a mejorar el parque. They're also willing to see how they can help in improving the park. Gracias y me da gusto volver a verlos a todos. Thank you and I'm glad to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Uh, sir, I think there's some people lined up already. Creo que hay gente en línea. Oh. It wasn't like. Oh, okay. Jose, Jose. Como? Jose. My name is Jose. Uh, Jose, Ch I mean, last name is Chavez. Jose Chavez, last name. Uh, yo, vi yo soy residente de la ciudad de Arvin. I am a resident of the city of Arvin. Uh, Yo no más vengo a hablar sobre la infraestructura de las de las calles que tenemos en Arvin. I'm just here to speak about the infrastructure on the streets we have in Arvin. Uh, básicamente le estoy hablando de la Edison y Davis y David. Basically, I'm just speaking about Edison and David. Uh, cuando arreglan cuando arreglan esas calles. When those streets are fixed or uh, worked on. Va el troque y, y, la, y las personas que están haciendo van tapando los hoyos, pero no, no lo hacen de una manera correcta porque... The truck goes by and they cover up the hose, but they don't do it in a very correct manner. Porque los troques de Greenway que llevan a uh, 25 mil libras... The Greenway trucks, they weigh up to 25 mil, 25,000 pounds. De nada sirve que le pongan, que le tapen eso, con, con, de nada sirve que la mala estén tapando el hoyo porque... It, it just covering up the hole doesn't work. Uh, pues está gastando el dinero. Money is being wasted. Uh, también quiero hablar también de hace el viernes 23 de julio. I would also like to say on Friday, uh, June 23rd. Al, yeah, a las cuatro y media de la mañana. At 4.30 a.m. Cuando yo iba a mi trabajo. I was on my way to work. Um, básicamente yo recuerdo esos, esos caminos, yo trabajo en Mettler. Basically, I know those roads. I work in Mettler. Hubo un accidente de 40 carros. There was a 40 car accident. Uh, todo se acabó como hasta las ocho y media. Porque la calle estaba cerrada. The street was closed until like 8.30. Uh, yo nomás les quiero decir. 
I would just like to say, Yo sé que todos necesitamos ayuda. I y, know that we all need help, but y que uh, pues lo distribuyan por lo más la, pues no todos todos ocupamos todos ocupamos uh, ayuda. We all need help, pero que lo distribuyan correctamente. But have it be distributed evenly. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can I, can I ask, uh, if, if he'd be willing to leave his contact information with Mr. Alsip? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Ojeda. I am a resident of the city of Arvin. También como mi compañero me preocupo que la, la calle Tejón I am also worried that like on Tejón Street también tiene muchos hoyos y están muy grandes desde, very big potholes y están desde la um, Herring they uh, start from Herring Road hasta el Camino Real until El Camino Real y, y después otra vez está muy mal de la Buena Vista and then again from Buena Vista Road hasta el 58. To Highway 58. Ahora que, que se pone lluvioso, se, es muy peligroso ese when, camino. When it rains, uh, that road is very dangerous. Y es el camino que se usa para ir a los trabajos al campo. And that's the road that's used when you go work in the fields. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Tim Prado. I represent Comité Progreso de Lamont, and I'm also a resident of Lamont. I first want to thank the leadership of the board for giving the $10 million infrastructure for flood prevention, both in Lamont and Fuller Acres. And second, just to remind the board that we just don't need flood prevention. We would also like to a continuance of repairs and redesign of some roads in our community, as well as sidewalks. And as my second role as director of the Lamont Public Utilities District, I would like to thank the board for last year for their investment in smart meters that went away allowed us to get half of our meters replaced with smart meters, which allows us to remove those analog meters, which were 70% inaccurate, and allow us to put new ones that are 99% accurate. So that helps the residents of Lamont with future drought prevention and also correct water metering for usage and billing. So I just wanted to thank you, and thank you for your time. I'm not sure the residents thank you. <laughs> I'm just doing my job as to prevent water usage going wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have our next speaker, please? Good evening. Uh, Gustavo Aguirre with Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment. And I will want to ask one request. Uh, in the past uh, hearings like this one, we were given more time with uh, Mr. Uh, Mike. When he was chairperson, he allowed us to, all the residents to say everything they wanted to say. And I think these special meetings, uh, you should consider that because sometimes, you know, the residents are telling us, you know, how, what can I say in, in two minutes, you know? Please consider that for future meetings because it's very difficult, you know, for people not accustomed to speak in public, trying to choose the words to make their point across. Uh, it looks like the budget that you have this year is better, the income is better for the county. And uh, I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things that changed from the first uh, preliminary, preliminary budget to, to this one. Uh, I'm happy, you know, to see some changes. Uh, but uh, one of the areas that I think is uh, not being considered is uh, all the issues that uh, people from, resident, from the, the residents are raising about, you know, uh, sidewalks, about uh, public lights and, and the small streets. Uh, last uh, week we were meeting with uh, the, the Public Works Department, following up on projects that we are working with, with uh, residents. And, you know, we were, they are trying to do their best, you know, applying for funds, but, you know, it's only for arterial streets, those streets that have, you know, 
uh, some record of uh, fatalities and all of that. In those uh, small communities or neighborhoods like Woods Edition, very difficult to find grants to, to make improvements there. I think you should consider you know, those, and I believe Fuller Acres will be another neighborhood that is difficult to find the, the funds you know, through grants. I think on, you have the opportunity to put the funds on through the budget to improve those communities and take care of those those uh, needs because uh, it's, my understanding is very difficult to to find uh, funds other other ways. Um, and yes, I think there is progress made uh, in terms of the flooding issue for Lamont. Uh, Supervisor Couch, we really appreciate uh, you taking care of that. And, <coughs> is moving, uh, we really appreciate that, but you know that uh, there is still a lot of need in the communities and we want to see, you know, you paying attention to, to those communities and, you know, obviously, you know, any supervisor in your own uh, districts, you know, we would love to see that you are doing your best, but and sir, again- We're about uh, 45 seconds over, so yeah. could you bring your comments to a close, please? Yeah. Uh, so please, I think uh, streets, public lights, uh, sidewalks, all of that, I didn't see that uh, taken care of. Please consider, uh, you know, allocating to, to that, that, uh, uh, those needs in the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joaquin, uh, my little mom, my whole life. And um, I'm asking for consideration of um, not just repay, uh, actual paved road. We, I live in a dirt road, and uh, it's winter lane. And I have a picture of it when it gets rainy. And then uh, I just urge or even ask anyone, just to direct, whoever's in charge of all this, to just go over there. I'm just asking to go over there. Get on Haybecker and just look down winter lane. And I even encourage you just to drive through it. And I don't have to explain the situation, but just the two main points is um, it gets so muddy that kids, when kids walk, you don't know how deep the puddles are because there's potholes. They fall, they fall. I've seen kids stuck in the mud, cars get stuck in the mud. And then um, when you, and you have to walk to the sides also, and there's dogs, like there's pit bulls, German shepherds, right? people at the fences barking in their faces, you know, and um, that's it. I just, please, just, somebody go over there. Like, I just want you guys to share that. Right now, there's a lot of momentum going on in Lamont. All kinds of streets are getting paved. It's pretty cool. I just don't want this that our street now to, to miss the boat. And then who knows when it's, I mean, the house I met was built in 29. And as far as I can remember, all my uncles and them lived in the 60s and 70s. It's always been just a dirt road like that. So uh, thank you all, appreciate you. Sir, could you leave your contact information with Mr. Alsop? Uh, thank you, appreciate thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Juan Morales and I am a deputy public defender with the Kern County Public Defender's Office. I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to join in my colleagues' comments and add that unless all of us are protected when faced with the state's prosecution, then none of us are. But with that being said, one of the reasons that I'm here today is for the people inside of my office, specifically support staff. Every day when I walk in to work, when I come back from court, I'm greeted by two support staff, two secretaries to my right. As I go upstairs, my personal secretary says hello to me and I see other individuals hard at work. Even though that my sub m there are members of that office who have been working in that office and if for the county since before I was born. When I first found out there hasn't been a cost of living increase since 2007, I was a little bit mortified. I don't think that I'm the smartest person on the planet, but the first thing that came into mind was the concept of inflation. I started asking myself, what has been the inflation rate since about 2007? So I went ahead and did a little bit of math. I found out since 2007 that, about, that our dollar has lost about 20% of its value in buying power. That basically means for a worker in 2021 to make what was the equivalent value of a dollar in 2008, they would have to make approximately $1.26. When being a recent transplant, being able to see rents skyrocketing, the median of houses increasing past $300,000, when looking at how expensive it is to get in Kern, to actually be here in Kern County, I start wondering about how the current staff is going to make it for the next 20 to 30 years. And not only them, 
but also the support staff that will inevitably join our office and help us with our good work. The only question I have at this point is essentially, will the Board of Supervisors eventually do something? Because if it not, because if it does not, then don't we take the risk of the current county system falling apart in front of us? And then the question becomes, is that really the legacy that you want to leave for this county? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Could we get our next speaker, please? Hello, my name is Lindsay Andreas, and I'm also a deputy public defender here in Kern County in the juvenile division. In the 2020-21 fiscal year, our budget was cut by 7.5%, which effectively unfunded about 14 positions. Um, the, I noticed the adjustment to the preliminary budget to add an additional four deputy public defender positions. However, that's not sufficient. We need additional attorneys. We need critical support staff as well. Um, we have a very limited resources and we need to lower our caseloads to have the adequate support staff so that we can provide um, not just better services to your constituents, but their constitutionally required services. As well as I wanted to request a cost of living increase for Kern County employees. As it's been mentioned before, it's been over a decade since we had a cost of living increase and the cost to live in Kern County is increasing. Rent, rent has um, increased. The housing market prices are uh, much higher than they were even three years ago, as well as there's just a lack of affordable housing available. And when our employees, when we are not providing for that, we're not attracting and we're not retaining employees here in Kern County. And when we don't retain those employees, it costs us more in the end because we train them here in Kern County for a few years and then they leave to other counties to get make more money. In the end, it costs us more. So I would request that you um, please give that cost of living increase. Thank you. Can we have our next speaker, please? Uh, Randy Andrade, I just wanted to clarify from earlier my statement. The email I sent to you guys was on July 30th of the 2020. I did send it to all of you. I resent it. Um, so you guys do have that email again. Um, Sorry, last July? Yes, July 2020. July 30th, 2020. And then I got the call to my home on July 31st, 2020. Um, and I've been disputing with the department that that was inappropriate for the whole year. Um, gotten no results. Um, again, I don't think it was your guys' intention, but that was kind of the result. I had someone call my home, tell me it was unfortunate I didn't like my job. I've had issues with the department ever since. Um, I am a disabled. I'm not trying to look cool with my sunglasses. I am sensitive with, with light. Um, I was given a computer that I couldn't adjust the brightness. It was maxed out brightness. I asked for accommodations. Went on for several months without any accommodations. Recently, um, on that day, the 30th, when I, um, when I got a, the 31st, when I got a call from HR, I was accommodated for my disability only after having my union, who's here asking for raises for all of us, was there to represent me, and having the Department of Rehab there to also represent me. Um, that was only when they, that was only then that they gave me accommodations, and even then, they've made it very difficult for me. Recently, um, when we had to come back home, uh, come back to the office, uh, the software that I have that accommodates my eyes or my visual impairment reads information out to me out loud. So I asked for a headset so that I could not share information that was private to my peers. Um, I was told that I would need an additional doctor's note saying that I had a hearing impairment in order for me to get my headset. Um, obviously, that's overboard, and I'm sure everybody has headsets at work. Um, so I would like you guys to help me out with my HR to get training on how to accommodate people with disabilities. Um, apart from that, um, I wouldn't be a social worker here without asking that you guys do a little bit more to help our kids who are on drugs. Uh, we have no inpatient services for them. So currently our approach for children who are examples, I won't share names, but obviously are on fentanyl, heroin, meth, tobacco, alcohol, some a combination of all of them are encouraged to come back into foster care um, and take outpatient services. Even though they won't stay at Jameson, they won't stay there more than 20 minutes before they leave and that's the end of that. They don't chase them. They call law enforcement, make a police report and that's the end of it. Um, so I really, really would appreciate that you guys help me out with some of the kids on my cases who again are on fentanyl, heroin and meth 
and are being encouraged to just come back into foster care um, because we don't have any inpatient services for them. Okay, Supervisor Perez. Uh, thank you so much. You currently are having problems with HR. Is that your, where you are now, sir? Yes, the Department of Human Services. Okay. Did you say earlier you were also my constituent? Is that correct? Uh, correct. Correct. Could you uh, either send an email to my office or, or get your contact information to my I resent the email Nicole? that I was talking in regards to, but I could send a separate email with my information. You resent again. it when? Uh, just now, like Perfect. 20 minutes ago. Got it. And you sent that to my work email? District 5 email. Okay. Excellent. We'll be in touch with you. Okay. Thank you, all. Thank you for your Appreciate patience, it. sir. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Um, good afternoon. My name is Eddie Hernandez. I'm 15 years old. I would like to. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. What is your last name? Hernandez. Hernandez. Thank you. I would like for you to invest in Weepatch um, Park. I remember when I was a little kid, um, my parents would take me to play in the park since we have um, since we have a lot of family members. It was the best part of my childhood. Now, now as my dad um, drives by there, I can see an empty park. There's no playground for kids to enjoy that park. I believe if you fix that, Park, um, you would be doing a great thing for the community of Weepatch as well for Sunset. Keep in mind that those kids are farm workers, farm worker kids, and they deserve they deserve best too. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, Board of Supervisors. My name is Ashley De La Rosa. I'm the Education Policy Director for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. In recent news, Bakersfield was ranked amongst the lowest educated in the country. And how can it not be when we, fully, we, we, we are not fully funding education? And education is not simply providing books and posing for a photo op, but it's providing the needed resources to our children for a better future. This includes Justly funding SEIU's demands of pay raise, the communities ask for basic human rights like clean water, roads to walk to school, lighting in the streets, and furthermore, social workers, behavioral health workers, practitioners that will continue to keep our students in schools and off the streets. In Fuller Acres, Vincent Pablo Trevino asks himself, I want to know why we are so underserved. Our kids don't even have a place to play. Where can our kids go to stay out of trouble? I ask the board to fund education and stop contributing to the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Chairman and fellow board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ricardo Del Hoyo, and I live here in Bakersfield, and I'm the lead union representative for United Domestic Workers. And I'm here representing over 7,000 IHSS providers that take care of the most vulnerable in our community. County services and departments are severely understaffed. As at-risk children and seniors are falling through the cracks, homelessness in our county are, is rising due to the lack of mental health services and care available. We're asking the Board of Supervisors to invest in public services and its employees. The public health crisis demonstrated just how crucial we are to the overall health and safety of our community. And now amidst the recovery, fully investing in, in the essential services and workers that are pulling Kern County through a pandemic is more critical now more than ever. Too many families, children, and elders across our community are seeking services are seeing services shrink and experiencing staffing shortages due to stagnant wages. This leads to a lack of decent care, growing mental health needs, more children seeking safe shelters, and families are being forced to decide between feeding their families or seeking care. But critical services like these can only thrive if the workforce behind the services is thriving. We, together with our county colleagues, urge the Board of Supervisors to take bold action and recognize and honor the public services that residents can find nowhere else but their local county government by providing across-the-board wage increases and bargain fair contracts that retain and sustain a top-tier service workforce. Enough is enough. We need a budget that works for all Kern County residents. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please?
Hi, my name is Jane Thompson, and I am a uh, community member of Tehachapi, and uh, I am <clears throat> a aerospace engineer and a transplant. I'm not originally from Bakersfield area, a Kern County area. I moved to California about five, six years ago for, you know, opportunity. I moved to the Bay Area to work for Apple. And I found myself working in Kern County uh, when I moved down here for my spouse. And I ended up working in aerospace. So I've really enjoyed living in Kern County thus far. It's a very beautiful county. Um, <clears throat> Tehachapi is gorgeous. I uh, love the desert, the mountains. Um, a lot of people, uh, my family on the East Coast, um, friends from the Bay Area, they said, why would you move to Kern County? Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. And um, I said that Kern County has all the infrastructure of California, and that's where pretty much everything that they enjoy comes from. And so I'm always so impressed by the community members here who are so strong, and there is an actual community here. I, I was another transplant in the Bay Area, and the community was withered from a lot of gentrifiers, one myself included. Um, nobody had ties to the community. Nobody cared about what happened to the residents who they displaced. Um, here in Kern County, there's still so much strong community. And I hear all these people who care about just the most basic needs, sidewalks, um, lights. Uh, and, you know, Tehachapi has a lot of those things, and it's a very beautiful place to live. And I hope that every community in Kern County can have those basic needs. Um, my, my friends who I've met who are also transplants in this area, they're not going to stay here. They're going to leave because this county doesn't have the services, the attractions that other places have. So I'm asking you, please fund your communities. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have our next speaker, please? I thought it would be appropriate for, you, for me to follow the previous speaker, as I am a, uh, a Bay Area transplant uh, in Kern County. Um, well, thank you, thank you. Um, I work in the Public Defender's Office. I've been here the last two years. Could, uh, we, could we get your name, sir? Sir, George Kadifa. George Kadifa. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, a, a difference between working as a public def defender in the Bay Area versus working as a public defender in Kern County is the um, the willingness of the district attorney's office and the courts to work with veterans, uh, very particular with veterans. They're much more willing to work with alternatives to incarcerations with veterans, which we're willing to be um, understanding of uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the veterans experience. Um, yeah, much more sympathetic to our clients that are veterans. Uh, however, our, and, and unfortunately, uh, in public defense, we see a lot of veterans, uh, Iraq War veterans, Bosnia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, uh, and you know we have uh, we, we interact with that. And um, unfortunately, though, our ability as public defenders to serve veterans is limited when we're not adequately staffed. And to be more specific about that, uh, the issue right now is because of the caseload and the volume of caseload we have. Uh, in order to begin that process of undergoing something like veterans diversion, that may take a couple of months. So I had one gentleman that was a Marine, uh, an Iraq war veteran. He was in custody and eventually he was released on a veterans diversion outpatient where he was supervised. However, in order to get there, that gentleman spent a couple of months in custody uh, because we in the public defender's office weren't able to meet with him uh, immediately following his arrest and begin a representation with him at that time. Uh, another example of this is within the misdemeanor offenses, DUIs, uh, domestic violence, and so forth, um, uh, obstructing police, uh, where we have a similar problem because we don't have the staffing to adequately uh, staff misdemeanor arraignments. And because of that, uh, we have clients that are veterans, or we have individuals that are veterans who end up taking criminal convictions because they never end up meeting with a public defender. Uh, and so, and, and this is, is seen in a number of different 
a bit, a faculty is a number of different areas, but it's very, I think, specifically with veterans. And I, it's very unfortunate in particular, and I, I'm wrapping up my time, is that we do have a district attorney's office and a court that is very willing to work with us, but when we don't have the adequate staffing, we're not able to even take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could we have the next speaker, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Yusidra Osby, and I'm a constituent of the DC Press. But today, I came to talk to you guys uh, about the same thing the gentleman just spoke about. Um, we have begun, at, all of us from now, we begin doing legal clinics for our folks who have uh, criminal histories and are unable to get the help that is needed from our public defender's office other than receiving a packet. Um, there has to be a point of uh, where we can be considered redeemable, and that is already uh, in place by allowing us the opportunity to get our records expunged, uh, receive certificate of rehabilitation, and um, reap the benefits of, of being uh, uh, going under undergoing Prop 47 uh, relief. Um, we ask that you include a higher budget for our public defender's office so that they can help those of us who are on a great path, um, improving public safety, um, taking care of our families and paying our tax dollars. And so um, please consider that in your budget, that increase for our public defender's office to be able to help um, improve the public safety and our people can can uh, raise the level of their success to take care of their families. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Clinton Pierce. Um, I'm in a different boat from a couple of people that spoke before me. I was born and raised here in Bakersfield. I have lived or worked in every one of your districts. My grandfather, uh, 30 years ago, ran for your seat, Mr. Couch, against uh, Ken Peterson. He taught me, uh, growing up in his little church in Wasco, where he still preaches to this day, uh, the value of community. Uh, his name is on one of the buildings at Wasco High School now because of the lifetime of devotion that he put into that little community. And he instilled those values in me. And for that reason, I came back after watching all of the friends that I grew up with go away to school, get an education, learn valuable skills, and then take them to other communities because they could make more money, because they could get more out of those communities, because they could put their skills to better use and raise a family in what they thought was a better place. I was gone for a while and I made the decision to come back uh, four or five years ago. I now work for the public defender's office. I'm not here to speak as a public defender though. Um, I'm not a union member. I do support everything that the union members have been saying though here tonight. My mother was a school nurse, still is a school nurse. She hasn't retired yet in the standard school district in Oildale uh, most of uh, my life and I saw the efforts that she made to invest in a community. And the way that I, the, the problem that I see with this county is that they are not investing. They're trying to stay afloat. And the community is growing and um, I don't think that you're making the appropriate decisions to support that growth and to encourage that growth. It's one thing to make sure everyone's comfortable, which I don't believe this county is doing uh, without a wage or a cost of living increase for 13 years. But it's entirely an, another thing to prevent your community from growing as it should. I believe in the values that I learned in this town and I want to stick around. But just as I saw growing up, um, some of your kids, I think, as well as uh, some of your friends and colleagues, I watched them leave this town and not come back. Now that I am in an office filled with transplants, I continue to see it. They come for a year and they leave. 
And that's because this community does not support them, not just financially, but with resources that can grow this community. So I'm asking you as a board to yes, please invest in Kern County. Yes, sir, we're almost a minute over. If you could please bring your comments to a close. Thank you. Please don't just invest with the idea of trying to keep us afloat, but please invest boldly with a plan to grow. And that can start by a cost of living increase that is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, board members. Um, my name is Nadine Escalante. I was a county employee for 10 years working for probation, which I absolutely loved. My son has now taken on a career working for probation because I have been born and raised in Kern County. I believe in this county. I love this county. It's beautiful. We have a lot of good qualities. Like the young lady said, we are very truly commu community here. The first time I spoke at a budget meeting, didn't even know what I was doing when I came here. Um, Mr. Maggard was my supervisor and I said, where is our property taxes money going? Here, we're here hearing the same thing five years later. One billion dollars, where is that money? I'm, I felt bad because I was going to come here and complain about a pothole in our neighborhood. We have lights. Thank you, Mr. Maggard. We have curbs. Thank you, Leticia. Our neighborhood is maintained, but I have been a thorn in this woman's side this last year about the east side, how devastating it looks. We have no lights. We have no curbs. We have trash in empty lots. Children see this. This is not okay. And Mr. Peters, this is the first time I've actually seen you. And you, your body language seems like you are so bothered by what we are saying. We are the community of Kern County. People voted for you. So we are going to continue to come to these meetings and speak up about the issues that are going on in this county. The one issue about domestic violence, our Sheriff's Department on Law Enforcement only get two years of, 16 hours of training every two years. So basically less than 32 hours of training and you're arresting people for domestic violence. That's uneducated, uneduc that's poor action on your part. The fentanyl issue, we have had over 80 deaths this year alone. The coroner's office cannot keep up with all these deaths. We recently had a student from East High who accidentally overdosed on fentanyl. This child was going to college. So this is why I keep looking at you, Mr. Peters, because I want you to understand us community members as we're talking to you, please take this seriously. Don't roll your eyes, don't look away for us. Don't say you're over the limit. The very first meeting I was here, I probably spoke for a good four minutes because the rest of this board wanted to hear what we had to say because they were invested in this community. You seem like you're bothered. Also, um, the families and employees asking for waters and lights. We're this is pathetic. I know I'm over my time. I can see. Okay, we have a lot of people that we want to hear from. I know. And letting one person control and dictate the meeting and go over takes time from other people. We want to make sure that we get a chance to hear everybody. Please quit making the county families. Get children fed from water and streets and grass. Can we get our next speaker, please? They get at least less than $20 million. The Kern County Sheriff's is proposed to get $248 million. The SEIU workers here are asking for a cost of living adjustment because they haven't gotten a raise since 2007. And you guys all, the irony that exists while you all sit there and say, we see you, we hear you, we might have to do it next year, while earning more than $100,000, much more than $100,000 each year. And you're telling people who literally sacrificed their lives, their livelihoods in a global pandemic that it's not good enough, 
I, my labor is worth more than your labor. And that is ridiculous. And I say this not as a moral, a moral referendum on individual character of even individual sheriff's officers. All I'm saying is that all of these other departments continue to be underfunded because of your choices. And the budget is a reflection of your moral priorities. And the way you treat your other departments is disgusting. You guys are literally failing us. People are asking for sidewalks and street lights, and you continue to spit in their faces every year and not fund it. It's such, I am so excited to literally work my ass off to on, in the elections that will come next year for two out of the five of you. And I know this might even be embarrassing, but you guys are here to represent us I do not care what every individual one of you wants. And I wanted to just ask the community behind me, if you think SDIU workers should get a raise after sacrificing their livelihoods in a global pandemic, could you please raise your hand? So the community has spoken. So if you fail to do it, it's on you. Do better. Thank you. Could we get our next speaker, please? Hi, my name is Michelle Salazar. Um, everybody here but Peters has been familiar with me. I've had opportunities to sit with some of the Board of Supervisors. Two years ago, I actually had a Board of Supervisor tell me, don't tell me that you can make more money in Fresno. If that's what you want, go. And for the past two years, I have seen so many experienced DAs, public defenders, deputies, firemen, social workers, nurses, anything you can imagine, leave this county. My daughter, she started working for the county two years ago for $15 as a sheriff's aide. She's actually getting a job right now in Portland for $19 an hour. She found a two-bedroom apartment for $1,200. Everybody has options, and they are taking them, and they are leaving them. And the most valuable thing you have in this county is experience, and you are letting it walk out your door time and time and time again. It takes experience for the deputy campuses to run in and try to save victims under fire. It takes experience for the firemen to go take care of those police officers after they've been shot. It takes experience for the social worker who is investigating families of domestic violence and substance abuse to know when it's safe to take a child or when it's safe to leave a child and when to take it. But time and time again, all of you let experience walk out this door every single time. And that is not an investment in this county. We have our next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rosa Lopez. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, and I'm here as a member of um, the Rapid Response Network and the Criminal Justice Coalition. Uh, I'm also a policy advocate for the ACLU Office of Southern California. And I'm here to urge you, the board, to listen to the community's plea uh, and reconsider our business as usual approach to the process of, to the budget process. It's time that as we slowly recover from this pan devastating pandemic, uh, we need to reprioritize. Uh, we need to prioritize people and community. We need to address the core issues of community violence. Um, yesterday's uh, incident was, is a tragic reminder of how we are a priority invest our, sorry, of how our priorities are not addressing the root cause of community violence. Um, it's time to appropriately fund the frontline departments and community-based organizations that address these issues, that provide services and support to community members that are, are suffering from mental abuse, substance abuse, and are not needing housing assistance and other basic needs. It's time that we invest in the public defender's office. Um, it's pathetic that I read that the public defender's office is about twice, receive as about twice less or less than half of what the DA's office uh, received. And so if we're talking about investing and building a strong community, we need to invest in these departments that put their, their skills and their lives in the front line to provide safety for our public. So I urge you to please reconsider a pause on this uh, 
fast approach and talk to the departments, talk to your constituents and reconsider how we are approaching to addressing public safety uh, challenges that this community face. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have our next speaker, please? Good evening, my name is Lori Pesante, P-E-S-A-N-T-E. Uh, I would like to note that of all the things that are um, being said tonight, I don't see anybody from Rosedale up here to complain about their kids walking through obscured potholes filled with water. So there's money in there somewhere and it's going to someone. It's clearly nobody in this room, all right? So where is that money? Kern County government, according to the SEIU analysis, that we signed on to, $900,432,000. That's what y'all are worth right now. Where's that going, right? The American Rescue Plan, $174.8 million. Let me say that again, because that is a hell of a number. $174.8 million. Well, when I was a public defender here in Kern County, I was the only Spanish-speaking attorney in my unit. I was the one who had to take other people's cases at Lairdo to interview them because we didn't have interpreters, okay? I had a reduced caseload in honor of my designation as the Spanish-speaking attorney in the unit. I had 200 cases. I don't know what it looks like now. I'd like to hear those numbers. Back then, we were out funded by the DA's office four to one. For every four dollars the DA's office got, we got one. And when I complained about this and I asked, why is this a chronically underfunded public defender's office? I was told, please don't complain about it because we're being told that we might have to dismantle the public defender's office altogether if you complain too much about it. People weren't getting promoted, okay? We got a serious problem in here. People are asking for basic stuff. We're not even up above the second level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, folks. Let's get there, and not just for the few, for everybody, because we got the money to do it. And could we have our next speaker, please? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hector Hernandez. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that everybody has said uh, tonight. All I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you guys is to to go to the communities, to go see what's going on. Uh, some people were talking about Arvin, Lamont, uh, others about Taft, Weepatch. Um, you can go all over the county and look at the same problem. The county is not doing nothing to, to help all these communities. If you go to the, uh, the west side of 99, it looks beautiful. You go on the east side of 99, it's a different story. And, it's, it, and you can go around the rural communities and you're gonna find the same thing. But this is the funny thing, is that when you guys are running for election, there you guys are taking pictures with the communities. You guys are not doing anything once you guys, once you guys get elected. And this is the community that's talking right now. That's why we're asking you guys to reconsider your budget, to, to look at what's going on in the communities, what are the basic needs. You have union members here that are working in the communities for, for the county, and you guys are not doing anything. I mean, I'm just hearing some of the complaints that they're having for 13 years not having a race, and you guys are making good money there, you know, representing our community. So I'm here to tell you guys, get out of your good, comfortable office, go to the heat, go look at the communities, go look at the roads, go look at the, some of the areas that needs lighting, needs sidewalks. My kid was talking about Weepitch. I grew up in Weepitch, and you go there, the park is empty now, you know? When I was a kid, we had to, we had to walk to Weepet to play, and you're going to see the same thing in other parts in the in the county. So I'm asking you guys, you guys are representing the county, uh, but you guys are not doing anything. Thank you. Yes. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Mercedes Macias. I'm here as a lifelong member of this community, especially District 2 in Tehachapi. Um, and I'm here as a representative of Sierra Club. Um, I'm also here to support my labor brothers, sisters, and siblings in the request for increased funding to essential public services. 
As others have said, what we have here in Kern is continued generational trauma where children are born for the uh, preterm and continue to struggle to breathe for the rest of their life due to the toxic pollution caused by oil and gas. In our community, families have to choose whether or not to pay bills or pay for their inhalers. Our families have always been struggling, but with the pandemic, we are all struggling and suffering even more. My mom went three months without her inhaler. This inhaler helps her deal with her, uh, her long-term COVID-19 breathing problems and also breathing problems due to valley fever. Um, like so many others dealing with chronic illness, uh, my mom doesn't go to the doctor, she goes to the ER, she goes to Kern Medical. And those places are already overwhelmed by a lot of those families doing the same. Um, there are many families who give up navigating a system of accessing public benefits um, because by design it's complicated and made even more so by the fact that there are not enough county employees to help with social services. Especially now when people are without jobs and other public service uh, system is beyond overwhelmed. Our budget is a reflection of not just our values, but our morals as well. Do not inflict continued generational trauma. Invest in Kern County. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for any questions or comments. As Supervisor Perez. Thank you. Jim, could you, I'm not sure, uh, Ryan, who the appropriate person is to uh, address the question, but regarding the broadband in the rural parts of Kern County versus parks, I hadn't really heard that before. Could you either today or tomorrow prepare some remarks or even provide some insight here as to our methodology regarding that because it just seems like such a great inquiry regarding, you know, bang for buck with, you know, low performing census tracts, if you will. If now is not the right time, then tomorrow when we further our, bu our budget discussions, I'd like to hear more about that. Ryan, does my question make sense? Yeah, we'll try to have uh, Jim talk a little bit about our ARPA designation and what else is available. Jim, you heard some of the concerns from the public, right? I mean, it's so exciting. You know how thrilled I am about this plan to yeah. put broadband in the parks. But the larger question of a community like Lost Hills or a community like Taft, you know, that we know is so heavily rural and so densely, you know, low census tract in terms of median income and, and whatnot. It, it, can you just help me understand that better? Sure. So the, the, um, the supervisor Perez through the through the chair, um, as, as you mentioned, the the county's uh, focus on on using ARPA money to try to bring uh, high speed internet to some of the rural communities is mainly focused on on the county parks because that's where we have a physical presence, but also um, because because it's it's not uh, laying fiber uh, uh, throughout the county, uh, which is kind of how traditional broadband, you know, high speed internet is brought to different communities because doing those types of projects is immensely expensive. You, you, you wouldn't be able to touch it with, with the ARPA money here um, because of that. So, so our, our strategy is to try to bring um, direct high-speed internet there and then broadcast it wirelessly so that all can participate and get on that and, and utilize that service. At the same time, um, that's a free service. It's, and it, when you talk about bringing broadband to communities uh, in the traditional sense, then that would require an, an internet service provider um, for that in that last leg to the home and, and a traditional you know, monthly bill to, for, for that kind of service. So it really is a different strategy, but, one, but it's largely cost driven. So when we look at who and can effectively, yeah, and, la and land use becomes a big part of that cost, right? Right, right away. Um, and land use. Some of these, um, are, there, there is quite a bit of investment being made by the federal and state level through grants to service providers to put these, this kind of infrastructure in. Um, not a lot of counties or cities are doing that work themselves anymore. So, um, and we've been in touch with, um, well, and, and let me go back for a second. So I believe, you know, currently both the federal and the state government have put plans in place 
uh, upwards of $15 billion in funding available to do this kind of work. Some of that's being done right now. Um, I'm aware of, of some areas such as Lost Hill getting fiber run out to Lost Hill, mm -hmm. not through the county or through a state, but through a private venture um, where they're presumably getting get some kind of government support at a higher level in order to make that investment um, pay for itself. Uh, we've been in touch with the superintendent of schools office to try to talk in a big sense about how that how that may um, unroll into some of these more rural areas. Uh, Lost Hills isn't the only one, but there's others. And we're looking at how we can leverage um, both what the schools are doing, what we're doing, and what these private investments are doing um, to try to bring broadband to these, these rural communities. So um, That is so helpful. It, it just sounds cost prohibitive as a land use matter. I mean, like a thousand times over. It, it's it, it's very much so. Okay, thank you. That is so helpful, uh, Ryan. What do we say to our employees here today? I mean, what really is the best response on the cola issue? You know, thirteen years without a cola. Some folks say they haven't had a raise in thirteen years. I think there's some confusion about that. I don't know if sort of pedantically working through the numbers is helpful anymore. Frankly, well, you know, what what do we say? You know, to the sort of emotional condition of our people, you know, that are that are asking for some response on the COLA issue. Uh, I know the budget as well as you do. I don't think we're as flush as with cash as some people may believe, but nonetheless, I do believe that it warrants a response, and I don't know if tonight is that time or, or if that is appropriately handled through employee negotiations, but, you know, it appears to be you know, a major impediment in, you know, the condition of our workforce feeling, uh, you know, valued and, uh, you know, in a place of upward mobility, if you will. Yeah. You know, I, these are big issues, and I don't mean to jam you up, Ryan, but I don't know how we not respond to what is, to me, an outcry from the, from the uh, employee base. Yeah, Supervisor Press, through the chair, I'm used to being jammed up, on, particularly on this issue. Um, I've, I've spoken about it quite a bit, and, and uh, uh, I've been very public about um, uh, how, how much of a priority it is for us to um, make sure we're paying competitive wages uh, all across all of our business areas and getting into a place where we can provide regular compensation increases for our employees, more regular, more regular, um, with COLAs. Um, our problem exists, uh, our, our, our biggest problem exists in those employees uh, in the county who have run through their 5% um, step increases. Um, and when you, when you come to work at the county, uh, you get four of those back to back to back um, to back um, pretty automatically. Um, and uh, what happens is, is we get employees who move through their steps, who move through those bumps in pay, who uh, in order to receive, if there's not being given, a, if a COLA is not being provided, uh, they get to a point where unless they promote, um, they don't have a chance to continue uh, seeing their compensation increase um, at, a, at a more regular clip. Now, uh, some employees are topped out and they don't either choose not to promote or they don't have the option uh, to promote um, or they can't promote uh, for one reason or another. Um, that seems to be our biggest issue and the vast majority of our county employees, um, the biggest percentage countywide are, are in that predicament and it's real. It's real and legitimate, and, uh, and it's a problem. Um, and we have to do something about it, as you know, and we are trying to do something about it. We spend lots of time talking about it and planning for it. Um, we are, uh, um, with regard to ARPA, um, and I'm motivated to say this, so I'll, I'll do it, but um, we, we are in uh, negotiations uh, with a variety of uh, unions. We do have a tentative agreement with uh, the members of SEIU uh, to provide them a $3,000 check um, probably by uh, uh, early, early fall uh, to each and every one of those employees represented by SEIU. 
Um, that is by no means, I'm not saying that as uh, to, to be a replacement for or the need to provide um, a more regular um, cost of living adjustment to their, to their salary. Uh, we have made them an offer uh, on just that, um, uh, I think just last week. And uh, that's been made to the union leadership. Um, we have been told that they're going to um, not meet with us until August 17th, I believe is the date, uh, to get back with us. But we have made them an offer uh, on a COLA. Um, and uh, it, uh, the, again, um, I'm saying that because of they're all in the room here. Um, and I wanted to let them know that if they don't already know that. Um, uh, our intention is to, uh, to do what we can as quickly as we can uh, to get ourselves in a situation uh, where we are mo uh, more able to uh, provide an uh, increase in compensation for our employees. And folks, uh, we can't just swing for the fences uh, so that it is not sustainable. It's got to be financially sustainable every single year. It compounds. And so we have to be thoughtful about how we do it. Uh, obviously, beyond, um, beyond the uh, request for COLAs, we do have a lot of need in our community. There have been a lot of folks that have come up to the mic and have asked for things that I would deem needed. Uh, and I'm, um, I've taken a lot of notes here, and uh, I know that the board members will want me to do what I can in each of these areas. Um, sir, if you'd like to talk to my office about Weed Patch Park, let's talk about it uh, and figure something out there. Um, we like investing in parks where we can. Um, there are a lot of things I have on my list. Public defender, we've heard from a bunch of uh, our, our public defender employees. I know our department head is in the audience, and I'll have a conversation with her. But if there are issues with um, salaries not being competitive, uh, particularly um, entry-level salaries, that's something that we can talk about uh, because recruitment uh, is important to us. We've got to be able to recruit and retain employees. And if that is an issue, um, we'll take it on. And uh, I think that we can sit down and talk about that. And I'm looking forward to doing that with our, our director. Um, I've kind of kind of rambled on here. I don't know Thank if I've you. answered your, your question, but. but I appreciate you very much. It, we are limited in what we can say and do as it relates to pay and benefits from here. It's illegal for us to try to negotiate here or make an offer or take an offer from you and start to sort of go back and forth and hear this. This is not the venue for it. And it's highly illegal, which is why I asked Ryan to respond because he understands the nuances and engages in these kind of labor negotiations on a regular basis, whereas we do not. So my apologies for uh, all of us coming across as aloof on this matter. I think I'm more, even more expressive than my colleagues, but I know that they're very cautious because our council wisely advises us to not negotiate or do anything that can be perceived as negotiation from the dais. My apologies. I can tell you that uh, my colleagues are desperate to uh, meet your needs. I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, how we get there, of course, is, uh, is contingent largely on the incredible prowess and genius of, of Ryan and his team, uh, Elsa, whom you've heard from so eloquently today. Uh, but I promise you, uh, there is a strong desire to meet your needs and to show you that you are um, that you are valued. Uh, this board does not have a long history of demonstrating that. Uh, it's just not a culture of that has been largely established. And so I, I don't believe that is because you are not valued. I just don't believe that. Uh, so please hang in there. Uh, you are so important. You know, Kern County is so important as uh, the one of the speakers indicated earlier. You know, we really feed and fuel the world. And, and it's one of our remarkable frustrations uh, with outsiders who uh, purport to know something about Kern County's economy and appear to be quite flippant in the response to our ability to provide uh, COLA increases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I joined this board 10 years ago, our discretionary revenue was one third from our oil and gas industry. It's now less than 10%. If you don't think that impacts the bottom line, you know, 
I would humbly ask you to reconsider your position and recognize that in Kern County, uh, we would be much better served and our interests much more rewarded, in my opinion, if we were to be aligned uh, in defending our industries and defending our economy uh, and putting the partisan nonsense aside. It does not serve Kern County uh, in, a, in a blue state. It does not. Uh, we, we have to be clever. We have to be wise. We have to be shrewd uh, in demonstrating that uh, the actions that occur outside of Kern County uh, as they purport to understand Kern County, uh, you know, are so disastrous for us and so tragic. Uh, it, it is, there, there really are no words for it. Uh, but I want you to know how much I appreciate you, and I so thank you for being here uh, and sharing with us the, the gentleman who said the uh, average at BK3 or B3K, uh, you know, is more than what he's currently making. You know, it is, this is such a striking uh, and compelling position. Uh, for so many of our people to be in. And uh, I want to say thank you, and I promise you uh, we're working like hell to uh, meet your needs and not lose you. Um, I, I believe that's how we feel as a family. So uh, hats, off to, hats off to you. God bless your work. Uh, yesterday's a reminder of just how fragile uh, this reality is. Uh, we can change it. You know, We can uh, shift that by what we do and how we promote our own values. Uh, but uh, we have to be... Uh, better moving forward, and uh, I, I hope we can be inspired to do that uh, by what we have seen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Perez. Supervisor Maggard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we have thousands of employees and dozens of departments, and they are run by dozens of our department heads. I am not aware of and have never heard before that we could have a uh, juvenile uh, deputy public defender with 350 children in her caseload. Uh, I would like to know more about that. And if that is four or five times the industry standard for what that caseload should be, I'd like to hear why that's handled that way and what can be done about it, because that directly affects uh, uh, our ability to serve those kids. So uh, th that, amongst other things, I'm interested in, but that is a particular interest of me, and I'd like to hear, to me rather, and I'd like to hear some discussion and a remedy to that. Thank you. Or at least another perspective on it. Thank you, Supervisor Maggard. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion on staff's recommendation. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second. Oh. Sorry about that. No problem. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Okay, having no additional items to consider, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to Tuesday, July 27th at 9 a.m. Without objection, we're adjourned.